Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, church. Whenever you're listening to this on Sunday, uh, it is just uh, great to be able to get into the Word together. And uh, it's just great to be partners in the faith with you. We're going to be in Judges chapter 6 this afternoon, looking at the nation of Israel and the major breakthrough that they had. Go ahead and be turning there. You know, what is a, be- a breakthrough? When we uh, look that word up, uh, we, we see it's a military movement or advance all the way through or beyond an enemy's frontline defense. Or another definition is an act or an instance of removing or surpassing an obstruction or restriction, the overcoming of a stalemate. You know, one of the most thrilling experiences that we can have in our spiritual lives is that when we have a major spiritual breakthrough, when God helps us break that stalemate that we've been in. When we're given that sudden advance or knowledge that removes a barrier to our progress, when we punch through the enemy's front line spiritually. We all desire these breakthroughs, but it can be extremely frustrating when they are hard to come by. We can even lose faith if it's been a long time that a breakthrough could ever take place in our lives. Church, during this time, we have a lot more time at home than we normally have had. We are not going out as often, Uh, we're playing it safe, but we have a major opportunity with this extra time to focus on having a spiritual breakthrough. And that's my prayer for all of us, that uh, despite the hardship we're all going through and the uncertainty, that we'll take this time to draw near to God and we will find something spiritually that we've been longing for. My prayer today as we look at Judges 6 together is that you'll be inspired that God loves to help his people have spiritual breakthroughs. Secondly, I want us to increase our faith that God will help us individually have those breakthroughs. It is easy to believe someone else can have a breakthrough. And so my prayer is that you personally uh, will come to faith that a breakthrough is right around the corner. And finally, to prepare our minds for action. What are we supposed to do individually and as a church to be a people ready for a breakthrough to happen? Let's go ahead and jump into the text. Judges 6, 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way from Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep nor cattle nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. Obviously, church, Israel at this time needed a breakthrough. For seven years, they were not doing well. They were oppressed, ruined crops. Their land was ravaged. They're trapped. They went up into the caves and clefts just to get away from the insanity and from the hardship. Church, they were stuck. Can you relate? Do you ever feel like, hey, I cannot get out of this funk that I am in? I can't get going. I can't get anything going right. I'm attacked at every side. I'm just hiding out at this point in my life. Some of us feel oppressed in our relationship with God, that we just can't seem to dig in and connect with God like we used to. Some of us are trapped and feel trapped in a sin or character issue that just weighs heavy on our shoulders. We just can't get out from underneath of it. Some of us, our marriage has been stagnant for seven years or longer, and we've given up hope that we'd have a breakthrough. Some of us have stagnant spiritual relationships. Our discipling times, just they don't have that spiritual magic any longer. Uh, We're not really changing, we're not really growing, we're not really connecting, we're not really finding the it that we know we can find. And some of us are stagnant in our dream, our spiritual dreams. They're just non-existent, or we had dreams and we're settling for lower expectations. We're just holding on for dear life instead of building a life for ourselves. Church, what did they do after being stuck? What did they do when they couldn't get crops, when they couldn't, uh, their animals were being possessed, when they were just ravaged at every side? What did they do, church? Verse 6, 
Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You know, sometimes it's got to get really bad before we have a spiritual awakening. Sometimes it's got to get overwhelmingly. You just have nothing else to do. You're so hungry and thirsty that all you can do is cry out to the Lord. You know, that's really the beginning of a breakthrough. If you've been exceedingly stuck for many years, you're in the perfect spot spiritually to experience breakthrough. Church, we just rely on ourselves until we get to that. It's just human nature. And God just gives us the key to a spiritual breakthrough. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. You know, that's the thing we have to understand about our God. When we drifted from him spiritually, he actually gives us over to the enemy and to, to weakness for a period of time so that we'll wake up and see our need for him. And so don't be discouraged if you feel uh, like this stalemate has been there forever. If it's bad enough to get desperate, then you're in just the right place for a spiritual breakthrough. Verse 7, as we continue, when the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, he sent them a prophet who said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the land of the Egyptians and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. And I said to you, I'm the Lord, your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you had not listened to me. My second point this afternoon, church, is there may be some sin in there. When you think of your current spiritual stalemate, there just may be some good old-fashioned sin in there. And so as the, uh, Gideon is seeking uh, an understanding of why there's an oppression, God reviews the tape and says, I brought you into this land, and yet you've not listened to me. I told you not to worship the gods of the Amorites, but you did it. And so a spiritual breakthrough begins with crying out to the Lord for help, but then it continues on into real ownership of where we've been and owning our sin. Sometimes this trapped, funky feeling it just might be because of some sin. When we've turned away from God, we've allowed ourselves to drift from Him, and He sometimes withdraws His protection for a time so that we'll see His need. Worshiping other gods was their issue. What is yours? You have to ask yourself, what could be the other gods in your life? You know, other gods, when we read biblically, are silly. Wooden idols and Asherah poles and, and fertility goddesses. But church, we are into them as well. For men, a lot of times our gods are shiny things. The latest technology, things made of steel, that latest crossbow if you're a, a hunter, the, the tricked out auto part if you're into cars, watches, cars, model airplanes, all that man cave stuff. A lot of times guys just have to have stuff to feel like they're important, to feel like they're manly, to feel like they're a conqueror. Women, a lot of times, uh, not to overly generalize, a lot of times there's just a fearfulness and insecurity. And out of that, uh, women, we control outcomes and we manipulate situations. And uh, that can be our God is wanting to know what's going to happen and trying to ensure a certain result. But whatever the sin is, we need to face it head on. You know what I've discovered is one of the best ways to know what your deal is, is to ask a couple people in your life. Ask someone from your household, hey, you know me. Shoot straight. What do you think my issue is? What sin do you think I need to really address right now? You know, everyone in your household will probably know pretty quickly and just hearing it uh, is going to help your heart and to help your heart to hate it and to turn it. And ask a discipleship partner or two, hey, you've known me for a long time. What do you think my deal is? What do you think I should be focusing in on right now in my relationship with God? Peekaboo, they will quickly be able to, to share that with you. You know, a lot of times that's the key to getting out of a spiritual stalemate is just to begin taking ownership and begin hearing the truth about who we are on the inside and the things that are trapping us. You know, sometimes we're stuck is not just because of our sin, but it might be that we're stuck because of Satan's attacks. You know, Job, the prophet, was in this circumstance. He couldn't find 
Here's sin. Hey, why am I stuck? Why has all this oppression happened to me? And yet even Job, as righteous as he was, as he was began to really question God's faithfulness. And uh, you know, God comes to him and says, hey, brace yourself like a man. You know, who, where were you when I created the universe? Where were you when I did these things? And he, he helped him get some spiritual perspective. So even if we're trapped, not because of our own sin, but just because of circumstances that have happened to us, we're still obligated to face those things faithfully and to stand up and have faith and to endure that storm and be faithful to God through it, knowing he's going to bless on the other side. Even our Lord was made perfect from what he suffered. And so his, his suffering, his being trapped in his situation wasn't because of his sin, but he still had to persevere and be faithful and face the challenge that was handed to him. As we go on to our, in our story in verse 11, the angel of the Lord came down and sat down in the oak of Ophrah that, began, that belonged to Joash the Abizurite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but if he's with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and has given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? You know, in this section, I just want to point out that God initiates the breakthrough. We cry out to the Lord. We take ownership of our sin and our faithlessness. But it's God that then begins to move. And he comes to Gideon and says, we're going to do this. And I'm sending you. And we're, we're going to overcome. This nation is going to break through because I am with you, mighty warrior. As we continue down, the angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on, on his rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of his staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas, sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid, you're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar of the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day it stands in Ophrah of the Abizurites. You know, what an incredible spiritual event Gideon witnesses here. He's conducting some worship, he's offering sacrifice, and all of a sudden from a rock, just a, a fire just flares up and the angel of the Lord is in the fire and Gideon is scared straight because he knows he's in the presence of the Lord God Almighty. You know, this, this idea of having a spiritual breakthrough is going to be pretty scary. Because it means having the type of times we're with God that set us on fire, but they're pretty fiery. You know, when our hearts have become open, when we're sensitive to the sin, we're getting convicted, we're, we're now really pursuing God with a pure heart and asking Him to purify us, that purifying fire is going to be intense. Our God is a consuming fire. And when we really have a spiritual experience, it's going to be pretty consuming. But guys, how our hearts are moved when we experience these types of times. This is, now this is a quiet time right here where you're a little afraid about what's going to happen that day because you have seen the Lord. But you're also quickened in your spirit. You also sense his power with you because he's purified the motives of your hearts. He's, he's told you he's with you. He's appeared to you. And now something intense is going to happen because you have spent time with the living God. Down in verse 25, as we continue, that same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then... Build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of his height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. You know, as Gideon continues to get it and continues to be used by God to start a revolution for his country, he is called to take a stand against his own family. Gideon already knew that worshiping Baal and worshiping on an Asherah pole was wrong. Most of Israel knew 
they had all been compromising, but they became an I'm okay, you're okay, and hey, we, you know, let's not be judgmental of each other. And God just says, Gideon, you need to step up and cut down those things and take, take those false gods and build an altar to the true God. And we don't have time to go into the whole story, but Gideon gets a lot of flack for doing this, and his life becomes in danger because he takes a stand for God. Some of us want to take a stand for God. We want God to move in our lives. But we don't have the courage to live by those convictions. Because to live by those convictions means a lot of people aren't going to like you. When you go close to God, when you, you take the assignments that he's given you, you've got to be living for an audience of one. Because the riffraff are going to make comments. But when you're on fire for God, there's no way to go but forward. In verses 33 through 40, Gideon, then after this intense experience, he fleeces God. And we're very familiar with that story. He asks the fleece to be made wet while the ground remains dry. He asks the fleece to stay dry when the ground is wet. He's really just kind of doubling back. God, are you still really with me? And instead of rebuking Gideon, God just, uh, he, he performs these miracles for Gideon. He increases his faith. And he lets them know, yes, I am really with you. You know, God gives us space to work through our doubts. The issue is, are you working through your doubts? Or are you working through your Netflix account? We have time to work through our doubts. We have time to dig in there. We have time to ask questions. We have time to, to ask people more knowledgeable in the word, things that we've always struggled, to, struggled about. We have time to get the answers we need. But are we numbed out? Are we going to God and putting that fleece out and getting those doubts and those fears dealt with so that we can be powerful for him? We move on to chapter 7. Early in the morning, Jeroboam, that is Gideon, and all his men camped at the spring of Herod. The camp of Midian was north of them in the valley near the hill of Morah. The Lord said to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. Now announce to the army, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left, leaving 10,000. You know, God loves bad odds. He doesn't love it when our Bible talk is stacked with spiritual heroes. He wants to make sure there's enough weakness in our groups so that he will get the glory when he moves through those groups. It's exact opposite we would build a Bible talk. If we were asked family group leaders, hey, who's going to be in your family group? We would handpick the people we like the most, that are spiritually strong, people that are out of themselves, basically have their lives together. It's a fun group, man, a group that God can really use, right? And yet God says, no, 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 no. Give me a weak group. Give me a small group. Give me a group with a lot of issues. Because when I move through that group and they save souls, I will get the glory. And it won't be because of your strategy or your plans or man's strength or man's personality. It'll be because of faith. It'll be because, be because of the living God and not because of personalities. We don't need incredible family backgrounds to have a breakthrough in our marriage. We have to understand that God wants the glory and he will even go to lengths to make sure the odds are against us so that he will get that glory. So 22,000 left and 10,000 of the army remained. It's, it's a smaller army, but at least Gideon can still be faithful with that smaller army, right? Nope, it is not small enough. God goes back to Gideon and says, you know what? The weaker the army, the better. In verses 4 through 8, he gets the army down to 300. Because he takes, has Gideon take the men down to the water and he says, whoever scoops up water in their hands and laps like a dog, uh, go take note of them and separate them. So he's got 300 dog lappers. 300 get down and pick up the water and lap like a dog. The other of the 10,000, they get down and on their knees and they just drink straight from the water. I guess that was the, the right way to do it. But 300 are dog lappers. And God says, those are the 300 that we're going to conquer Midian. So we've gone from 22,000 to an army of 300. You know, we have a God who is kind of a show off. <laughs> you know, 10,000 still too many. 
You know, I, you know, I want more glory than that. You, you can imagine Gideon's temptation. How about 5,000? Can we at least have 5,000? No, let's go lower. Okay, how about 1,000, God? Well, let's take it down. Let's take it down to 300 men to go against this foreign army. In uh, verses uh, 8 through 15, we don't have time to go through this uh, whole story together. But God, again, after weaning the army down to 300, he provides some encouragement to Gideon. He has Gideon uh, sneak into the foreign camp and overhear what the foreign army is talking about. And he, there's this private in the army who's sharing his dream. And uh, an another person interprets his dream and says, man, I, man, I just sense from your dream that God is going to wipe us out through the nation of Israel. And so Gideon overhears this encouragement, the way that God's moving and putting fear in the army's heart, uh, the foreign army's heart, and, and Gideon is empowered again. And so we see this process when we're seeking God, when we leave that threshing floor and we're willing to jump out there and do something crazy for God, something that doesn't make sense. We see this encouragement theme coming and this reassuring going, that, yeah, it's scary to walk with God. Yeah, it's scary to put your skin out there. But God comes through again and again and says, hey, let me, let me just reassure you that I'm working in this situation. We jump down to verse 22, uh, the ending here of chapter 7. When the 300 trumpets sounded, the Lord caused the men throughout the camp to turn on each other with their swords. The army fled to Bethshita towards Zerarah as far as the border of Abel Mehalah near Tabath. You know, God comes through at the end, uses these 300, the blowing of the trumpets, the fear that he's placed in the foreign army's hearts. They, they turn on each other and Israel suffers uh, a victory upon Midian that is just unbelievable. And they no longer live in the cracks and the crevices and they no longer have someone ravaging their land. They get their farm animals back. They get the plunder of the forming army. They, they get everything they had cried out for and more. Because our God loves to give breakthroughs to his people. Church, do you need a spiritual breakthrough? You know, as we've, we've seen one happen before our very eyes and we've been reminded of this familiar breakthrough in the word. Do you personally need a spiritual breakthrough today? If so, my question for you is, will you, will you do what the word says today, to do? Will you cry out for God's help? Jesus cried out in loud cries and tears. He begged God for his breakthrough. And what did he end up with? Rise, let us go. I must meet my betrayer. He came through for the joy set before him. He endured the cross. He had his spiritual breakthrough because he cried out to his God. Are you ready to truly cry out for God to move in your life? You know, as we close out and we uh, commune together, I'd like to read the scripture in Mark chapter 12, verse 23. Give you a second to turn there. In Mark 12, 23, we read, Then he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. You know, talk about a method for a breakthrough. Church, there is power in that blood that was poured out for us. And you know, the book of Romans talks about when we first experience that blood, when we die with Jesus in baptism and we're raised to a new life, we, we take in that power of a crucified Jesus, and we take in that power of a resurrected Jesus in order to live a new life. But church, you don't get baptized again when you want to have a breakthrough. What you do is, Romans chapter 8, you count yourself dead to sin. We can go each week back to Jesus, back to the cross. We can count ourselves dead to sin by the power of that blood, and we can count ourselves alive to Jesus by his resurrection. We can have a breakthrough any Sunday that we choose if we'll really get the right heart. And so church, I hope as we've looked back at this story, 
about the way that God's moved in Israel, the way that God chose a weak man, Gideon, to produce a nationwide breakthrough. God, I, guys, I hope today that some of us will have a breakthrough. Hope today some of us will take a, commune, a communion time with God where you feel like something just happened right there. And so I hope you'll take the bread and I hope you'll take the cup in that meaningful manner. Remembering that we have a God who loves the breakthrough, that he died in order for us to have a breakthrough, that he resurrected to assure us that we can have the power of a breakthrough and spend eternity with him. Church, I love you. Let's continue to love one another. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. Father, as I close out uh, in spending time in your word, God, I'm just uh, convicted and encouraged. Uh, God, convicted by how bad it often has to get before I want to change. How it's really got to be ravaged. How I really got to be hiding up in the cliffs before I finally humble myself. And God, it's just humbling to be a human and to be so self-sufficient when we really are just tiny grains of sand uh, drifting through the universe. But God, as we read this story, uh, Father, we want to be different. We want to be a people that cry out to you for help. We want to be a people that, that lean into uh, the blood of Jesus, that lean into our faith in you uh, as we seek to change and grow and be who we need to be for you. God, I pray that this communion time would be full of power and conviction. Uh, Father, that we come through this time as different people. It's in Jesus I pray. Amen.